Hey everybody, welcome to Hit or Die Podcast, episode 84. I'm here with your hosts, Jake Saldotti and Chad Rawford. And a uh, third time guest, but why, like would, five months. why wouldn't we get him on here? Uh, Marcus Walden, uh, thanks for coming on. Not a problem, guys. Thank you. Um, quick shout out to um, Fresno Landscape Construction, uh, Garrett Fulbright for uh, the sponsor for this episode. Uh, doing great a things. A couple. He's, he did, the, did a few episodes for us. Yeah, but this one... Um, I mean, he 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 just put put out some good stuff. I don't know if you've seen some of the landscape. I've seen some, some of it. He just did our backyard, uh, which was amazing. It's even, it's better now. We're about we're out there every single day. Um, it's easier for CJ to hit golf balls and a wiffle ball off of flat grass now than the hills. So, um, but thanks again for the sponsor from Garrett Fulbright and Fresno Landscape Construction. Um, and then uh, head on over to YouTube to subscribe to our channel. Uh, you can get us on Instagram, Facebook, Spreaker. <laughs> this is YouTube. <laughs> you might be there already. <laughs> yeah, but the, the people listening aren't on YouTube. I know. It's, I, you, I, I do it too. I forget sometimes that we're also filming this. You know what? Just share and like our stuff because <laughs> we're the best out there. Um, uh, uh, and congrats to new father. Yeah, baby number three. Cash Boss Walden. Yeah. Third time's a charm. Got the boy. Got the boy. Yep. Two girls and a boy. Hey, he's going to just don't let him get dressed up and, you know. I don't think that's going to happen. My uh, <laughs> my uncle, I'm a, he, I don't even know if he listened to this, but my uncle was the last one. So he had four older sisters and they all used to just dress him up like a little girl. And But he was a, he was the best athlete. So it turned out okay for him. He uh-huh. had the, the last laugh, I guess. Yeah. Um, but let's get into, you know, 2020 COVID, whatever season, just, uh, we talked to you right before you went back to, uh, the second spring training and, um, you know, just after talking with Luplo, I'm sure your story is kind of similar, just how tough this season actually was with the process of, you know, getting tested every day or every other day. And then, like you said, you were one of the only major league teams where you guys weren't even in your, your locker room. No, yeah, we were not in our clubhouse. So it was a little bit different in Boston. Uh, so we started spring training, I think it was July 1st. We were all in our suites. So we were up upstairs on the third floor, which was awesome for spring training. We had 60 guys in camp. So we'd be in, everybody you shared had one suite mate or roommate, whatever you want to call it. And it was, I think we had 28, 27, 28 different suites. Uh, me and Ryan Brazier got to share when I during spring training in the first part of the season, which one of my good friends on the team, obviously another reliever, similar story, a little older guy. Um, but that was the good thing during spring because everybody was split apart. We didn't really know what we were getting into. Um, once season started, that's when things really got hard. There was no team morale, team you know, camaraderie. That's where I didn't really like the feeling of – once the game started, that's the only time you really saw your teammates. I mean, I never saw Ploiecki or Vasquez one time until 7 o'clock. Um, so during spring training, we're in different pods, different groups. Everybody's doing things at different times. It works out really well. We, uh, Our pitchers were coming in earlier, getting our stuff done. We were done by 11.30, 11.45 most of the days. So that's when I really liked having our own group, our own time to get away. Once season started, it was more of a disaster, in my opinion. Just the the process? All of it. I think... Uh, well, routines, too. Yeah, routines. I know I, I listened to Luplo's thing the other day, and it was the same thing where we don't know where food is. We don't know where anything... Our weight rooms are different, everything like that. So in Boston, when we were at home, everything is just right up one flight of stairs above our locker room is normal. Our weight room, our kitchen, everything's there. Since we were on the third floor, everything took an extra 10 minutes to get to. So, I mean, my normal routine would start at 6.05. I'd start getting showered, get ready, do all my foam rolling, pregame stuff. I would have to start at like 5.40. So I'm starting 30 minutes early because I'm going up and up and down three flights of stairs probably two or three times just getting ready for the game. So getting dressed and coming back down, showering. Our showers were outside. We had like portable showers on the, uh, on the concourse. So things like that were things were a lot different. Things had to start or routines had to start earlier. Um, just made it a little bit more difficult to get ready for that seven. For us, it was seven thirty starts uh, in Boston. You guys are probably on like you had to sign up for times even to get there because they so, not all of you can be at the same spot at the same time. Correct. Yeah. Just like 
just like uh, the Indians, we had different times guys could come in. Pitchers were first. We had stretch at 345, which normally would be at 3, three o'clock. Um, but they didn't want anybody showing up before 2. So we could only be there, they said, maximum of five hours before game time. And then right when the game ends, you pretty much get up and go. Um, they just wanted as little contact or people being around each other as possible. We, uh, I still got there pretty early. I was one of the first guys there like I normally am. We, uh, but we had two different weight rooms. So some guys were lifting inside our normal gym. Some guys were lifting on the concourse. We had a full gym on the outside as well, not counting the visitor side. So we would get in there and we would probably have three or four guys in, in the, each gym, depending on who was there. Um, me and a couple of other relievers were working out outside. And most of our workouts were starting at 2.30, 2.45 when our stretch was at 3.45. So that was kind of the weird situation. Not everything was in that outdoor gym, but most of the stuff that we had to get done was in there. Um, was it the same on the road, though? Like, would you, so, I mean, did you guys get any itinerary of what it was like getting to, like, you or you just walk into a ballpark and it was like, a whole new set of rules. So our bus times were like the biggest schedule change. So we would take seven buses to the park. We had, uh, everybody had, they were like 20 minute splits. We could only have six guys on a bus at once. Um, and buses started at two 30 and the last bus was at four for a seven o'clock game. So guys that were on that late bus, it was, and most of them were starters that aren't starting. They just started the night before or whatever. And they would come in at or 40, depending on what city we're in. New York takes 50 minutes to get to the ballpark. Miami takes 50 minutes to get to the ballpark. So they were showing up at 4.50, coming and throw, and the game's starting in an hour. So it was kind of weird for those guys. We, uh, I was on the 2.30 bus just so I can get in the gym and get my pregame stuff done. So that was kind of the hardest thing is what bus you were on. Obviously, we had temperature checks walking onto the bus. Once we got off the bus into the stadium, we had another temperature check. Um, spit test, doing all the lovely COVID testing every other day. We, uh, there was just a lot of hoops to jump through just to get into the clubhouse, let alone once you got into the clubhouse, we didn't know there would only be half the guys in the clubhouse, half were in a auxiliary clubhouse somewhere else. Um, usually pitchers are off to the side. The position guys are in the main clubhouse. So it was kind of just trying to figure it out. When you're only going there for one series, it's, kind of tough by the time the third game comes around you kind of got a feeling of where the food is where everything is and you're out of that city and back home wasn't uh, now one of the rules speaking of spit tests was that there was not going to be any spitting allowed correct how did that go over uh i don't think that went really well in my opinion <laughs> was it policed uh i know for us it was policed at some point in some aspect of it we uh we had a lot of meetings early in the year. One of our last meetings that we had on Zoom was talking about mandatory mask rules. So we had our GM came on and we talked about, you know, we got to wear masks, we got to be safe, this, that, and the other. Uh, the uh, The hard part for me was when we're outdoors, we were still supposed to wear a mask. When we were, you know, when we were in our in our suite with our roommate, we can kind of take it off because we weren't really around other people. That's kind of how we did our contact tracing and. That's the real reason why we did seven buses to get on one airplane to all fly together, which made no sense to me, <laughs> but that's just the way we did it. Um, so it was kind of, you know, we, we followed a lot of the rules and I understand why we did it. We had, we definitely had some, our manager was a little older. We had some of our medical staff had, was a little bit older that, you know, obviously trying to keep guys safe. I fully understand it, but when we're in the dugout or in the bullpen or hanging out, it was, I was a big fan of whole wearing the mask thing and dealing with some of the rules that we had to do. But we did have some fines played out for us, and uh, guys started paying attention and locking it in a little bit more. I want to know, <clears throat> with the, the spit test, when did you get your result? 36 hours later. Oh, that's, that's how long it took. Yeah, so we would, we would spit every other day. Usually the morning of our next spit test, we would get our results from our last one. So, so like I so heard they were using three a, days and three days apart every other day every 36 yeah I'm not 24, really good at 24 math. in a day <laughs> not really good at math. <laughs> <laughs> so most of our spit tests had to be done by 4 30 the day that day so we would go from like two o'clock when you can show up to 4 30 we would get a text usually at like seven in the morning the following day not the next day the day so, after that so you would think Justin Turner would have known 
his positive test before. So that's game what seven. I I don't five, know what day six whatever it was. what day did he get tested and you know mm-hmm. when when what, we did, yeah what test was it that what yeah came what up tested. positive so I don't know any of that I wasn't paying attention the last few innings it was a sad day for me personally I was hoping the Rays were going to pull it off but uh, when you get tested my the rumor that I heard is that he had an inconclusive test which can happen. You're not supposed to drink anything or eat anything within 30 minutes of taking your spit test. So you have pure saliva. Um, when it's inconclusive, they can retest it, which could take another 36. Could be 36 hours. Could be they just rerun the test. I don't really know. The Red Sox never had a positive COVID test from the day we walked into the ballpark. So that was, I mean, I guess we played it pretty safe. I guess we did it the right way. We, uh, we had a couple guys right when we flew in. On July 1st, get some positive tests. They got quarantined for 14 or 21 days, whatever they had to do. Um, and then from that day on, we never had a positive in our alternate site or our home site. So that was one of the good things for us. So, if, but was the, what was the understanding that if something was inconclusive, did they treat it as a positive case? So they, because in that circumstance, what Chad's saying is. So we had one coach have an inconclusive and he did not make the flight that flight we were flying down to tampa from new york i believe so they got him a car he drove back to boston he didn't make the flight down to tampa we had a three game set down there um so that was the only time we had an inconclusive it came back that he had no symptoms he was fine but they do it for precaution just in case yeah, just in case and a, a lot so of the stuff is flight. so what we're saying is whoa, whoa, whoa. not were what so, you're saying so is, what, I, what i'm saying is justin turner shouldn't have played Game well, six. Or they should have postponed the game. That's but what I'm saying. As an inconclusive, they – I don't know. I, I mean, mean, they didn't postpone their flight. No, they, they, they just, just said, they kept they, one guy out. And, yeah, so they could have kept one guy out. You know, I'm just saying. And, and when is, Then when why did even test? take him out? Why even take him out? Yeah. At that point of the game. True. True. Is, you, know, you know, because you can do a nasal swab, and we, we had one, one scare with one of our scouting directors or somebody on our staff had – symptoms and pretty much anybody that was in contact with them in the last 24 hours got nasal swabbed and those can get back to you in an hour hour and a half and maybe that's what they did once they got it inconclusive mm. because you're not supposed to treat an inconclusive like a positive from my understanding i don't know yeah i'm glad we didn't have to do I, I, I mean it doesn't matter it is i just i actually feel for the guy for not being able to go out and dog pot i'm glad he was out there though i'm personally. glad he went out so after. that was where i, where I think i was yeah. gonna, i was gonna and take it that way your yeah. opinions on my opinion because he got beat up pretty good by the media after that what yeah. are you gonna do i think he still is he it's, was with the guys all day long oh he was with them all day he was in the in the dugout they have different clubhouses i'm sure but he was still batting he was still hitting. He was still playing third. He was doing his thing for seven innings. And they weren't in the. They weren't wearing masks anymore in the no. in playoffs. It was, the season's over. Yeah, they weren't. Um, well, no. I mean, even throughout the playoffs, oh, they no. weren't wearing the masks like normal season the during a game. Correct. You in, know what I mean? In the bubble, and that's the only question I had was if we were in a bubble, what happened? Because if they were supposed to be in a bubble, there should be no no contract tracing at all to get it. I don't. Who knows? But. Yeah. Obviously, there's people that are walking in, walking out of all these hotels and these stadiums. But uh, I'm glad that he got to go out there. I mean, he's played 10 years in the big leagues, and he's grinded. Obviously, when he was with the Mets, he never thought seven years later he'd be an absolute stud the way he is. I still think he's one of the better players in the league. So I was happy for him to be out there and be able to hold the trophy, in my personal opinion. Yeah, and I'm not trying to take that away. I'm just trying to – the MLB should have done a better job. Yeah, it all falls on – it all falls on Yeah, it doesn't fall on Justin I Turner. Mean, you don't have to comment on that. but I mean, I even said I would have I would have been running out the dug yeah, out, dug out with my fingers saying, F you, you're not going to stop me from dogpiling. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to find me some money? Yeah, what are you going to – I just made – 400 plus thousand on the world series yeah Bonus so i mean money. i'm glad that he went out there i think uh those guys and I, I mean listening to some of those guys talk they were happy that he was able to enjoy it and, and be able to hold the trophy with him well mookie yeah. i mean was one of the first to come out publicly and defend him like he's our guy yeah 100 percent. he's one of their brothers he's that's that's exactly and honestly i, don't, I, I didn't see one teammate condemn what he did no no i mean david roberts was right next to him and he had that same choice at the time, and he knew what he was doing as well. It's not like Turner snuck up behind him and gave him a hug. It was, right. He was standing next to him. And and I even think I saw you know bits of where the organization said we weren't going to. 
yeah. we're going to keep him from being out there, even though they probably should have. Who's to say? Everybody who's has to say that? I mean, I just know what I saw the next over. day. I was like, man, they're really laying into this guy. And it's like, and like I said, if you okay, here we go. Maybe got that's a, why they just we laid off. Leader, we got a big leaguer right here. I'm going to ask him a question. If somebody were to tell you, <laughs> what? Go ahead, go if up, somebody were through. to say, if in order to get a World Series ring, which you have, so I mean, so but it, say you don't have one. one. Yeah, just say <laughs> he wants more. No, right? say you've never gotten one, and yeah. you're you know you're coming down to it, and they're like, the only way you can get a World Series ring is if you get COVID. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to look at it, and, and that's where. Some of these well, younger in athletes. Justin's situation, I guess. In Justin's situation is a little bit different than like what Eddie Eddie Rodriguez had. Yeah. Eddie Rodriguez was bedridden for seven days and he couldn't play the season because he got sick in March or April or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And we don't know how he's going to react going into next year with a enlarged heart artery or something like that from my understanding. So that's where just because you got it, some guys are getting healthy, some guys are not. You know, and that's that's kind of the – what if part of this whole sickness or so on and so that, but I mean, there's a lot of guys that would give up a lot of things in their life to win that world series ring or to be on the field and be able to hold that trophy. Um, There's guys, some of the best pitchers and players in the world never got a ring. I mean, Mm -hmm. we can start naming them and there's guys that have played a long time. And, and I mean, talking to Steve Pierce after in the 19th season, he bought a, a, like a, something that goes on his chain, a little, medallion looking thing that had the world series mvp logo on it and he's like dude i've waited my whole life for this he played 13, uh, 10 years and working on 11 years when he got it and he was like there's not a chance i wouldn't wear it every single day you know so there's a lot of things that those guys would give up um and if they got sick or got the flu or things like that i mean mj played through the flu and scored 55 or whatever it was yeah. so i mean those guys are playing through it um i don't know that's it's not necessarily a personal question but it's kind of there's a lot of guys that give up a lot of things to win that World Series ring. Yeah, and you I you agree. would, and that's I, mean, I would personally. That's me, yeah. but that's I mean, you would you would bank my, on, you would bank my, on the health. You would bank on your health and yeah. hope that it wouldn't be a bad case. Yeah, my my response to you was I just have I want to respect everybody else's opinion on it too, and I think you yeah. bring up some good points yeah. in yeah. that. Because not everybody feels the same, and that's okay too. Yeah. No, and I and, and I, I don't think pretty, anybody should be condemned. Would, yeah, and you shouldn't you shouldn't be, you know, blown up for it. That's why I thought blown, blown up Turner or uh, was, you know, I didn't I didn't. I mean, it would have been a different situation if he had it and and wasn't at the field or anything, and then they brought him out after. Correct. Maybe that would have been a different situation. But or if like the team and the, the organization, the everybody said no, you can't, and he did it anyways. I mean, I guess at that point you can argue it, but but he earned that. Yeah, one hundred percent. He earned it. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, he had some big homers in the World Series. He was hot, man. And <laughs> made some big plays. Dude. Yeah, he was. He was doing it. And I mean, I think he's one of the main reasons they got there. Mm-hmm. Personally, not not necessarily got there, but got into Game Six and got into that situation. Um, but definitely playing some un- unbelievable defense. Had some big abs. Um, I think he needed to be out there. I would have been out there earlier. Personally, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what I said. I would have been like, "F you, I'm going um, out there." You gotta. I gotta be me. out there. Staying on the, the topic of the World Series, Game Six, Blake Snell's dealing two two hit shutout. He's zero for uh, the top three zero for six, six with six Ks. Six. They don't look even. They don't even look close. Not even comfortable in the box. We've nope. talked to a bunch of people, and, and Dave Serrano was our last guest who uh, I thought made some really good points on it. What say you, my friend? So I have a different opinion than I think a lot of people. How did they get to the World Series? They got there because of who's in the bullpen. They're stable of guys that throw 98, right? They got Nick Anderson. They got Casillo. They got all sorts of guys back there. I'm still putting Nick Anderson in that game. In that, pers- in in, that moment? In, my, in, that, in that moment. Blake Snell has not had a good r- results in the third at-bat. I understand he was throwing the ball great. I understand that. My answer as a as a former starter and a reliever, if you don't want to get taken out, don't get somebody on. Right? He threw one heater and missed his spot, got a single. They knew what they were doing. They got Nick Anderson going before the inning started. Hey, if somebody gets on, you're coming in the game. Okay. 
And that's kind of what happened. I mean, I know Kevin Cash is a family friend of mine. Nick Anderson's a good friend of mine. Um, I personally think they, they ran the game the same way they ran the game for the 60 games during the season and the next 14 games they played before that game. They, ran, they went to their strongest part of their game, which is their bullpen. Blake Snell's been a five-and-dive guy this whole year. The only time he wasn't was in 18 when he won the – when he or 17 or 18 when he won the Cy Young. Um, that's my personal opinion. He he was getting some – I don't want to say early outs, but he was getting punch outs earlier in the game on three or four pitches as opposed to usually he gets those same numbers on six, seven, eight pitches. But he, he had some unbelievable stuff. Don't get me wrong. He had some un, unreal stuff. But, I mean, I'm looking at what, what Bellinger's swinging at 0-2. He's swinging at curveballs two feet outside – He's getting Mookie on change-ups down and away. He's getting Mookie on heaters up. But eventually, they're going to clip him. And what they were saying was, Nick Anderson doesn't get clipped too often. And at the same time, if you say, Joey Wendell, let's play no doubles. And he's playing on the line with Mookie up on a ground ball. Mookie's going to pull it probably 85 90% of the time on the ground. Let's play no doubles. It's a double play. Boom, boom. Nick Anderson. Cash looks like a freaking hero. And now – they're going into the seventh with a one run lead. I mean, and, and so that's a good point. So I could, I would say, in, in, cause our game's obviously drastically different. <laughs> it with no outs, I'm not playing no doubles. One out guy on first. But in, but was it one out? I thought it was one no out. outs. One okay. out guy on first. You're right. Well, so, but that's, so what about the numbers that Mookie had against lefties versus yeah. righties that throw a lot of fastballs? Correct. And Nick Henderson had struggled. The last two, so I mean, it, the last six games he's been struggling. But I mean, so they're basing that they're they're taking the season numbers, not just you know what the six games are. Yeah, and and obviously they're real analytical, and they the Rays kind of go off of. And not that he wasn't a dude; he's one of the best pit relievers in baseball this year. I mean, anybody can and it, it all kind argue of went that the other way, and for sure, wouldn't even be talking about it. One hundred percent. And I, I said this to one of my buddies the other day: is what if it doesn't hit the net? on the left field line and it hits like at Fenway, we got hard wood right there and it bounces to the left fielder. Now it's got first and second. You got Seeger up, rolls a ground ball over to Choi, double play, boom, boom. Same thing. Now Cash looks like a hero. And now we're he's walking into the seventh inning with a one run yeah. lead. And and that's what a lot of it obviously it didn't bounce that way. It rolled down the line and I think more up. more than anything, what I noticed is as I just knew once they they took him out, it was over. It it benefited the Dodgers dugout, just because just they mentally. Faced, they mentally faced that bullpen. Oh yeah, and a it, lot. It, too. And that's the hard part. You're facing those guys. That was his fourth game out of six. Yeah, and that's that's not easy to do. And and they rode Nick Anderson hard. And but he was a hot hand for a lot of that season. Yeah. Those last 35, 40 games, he was throwing the ball well. Once he came back from the DL stint, I mean, his first game back from the DL, he was facing us, and he just. We thought we got him. We hit two fly balls, 396 feet, except the fence is at 398. And J.D. and Bogey both hit fly balls right right on the warning track. And we kind of thought we were going to break him loose a little bit. And uh, he ended up rolling, I think, 18 more scoreless right after that. So he's been – he was an unbelievable arm the whole time. I really like that situation for Anderson. He's been 100% pretty much all year. Now, is Snell throwing the ball really well? Yeah. But it's now gonna. He's already thrown every pitch he has at Mookie. They 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 stayed with like you said. What got him there? They they played by their playbook. Yep. So people don't like that, and I I I wasn't a fan of it. Um. But I mean, you. But and and, and I watched the, the Rays play quite a bit. Obviously, we face him a lot. He won forty two games out of sixty, running being the manager that way, and putting Nick Anderson in those situations, or putting in his bullpen with Fairbanks and and Casilla in there. I personally think he went right back to his strength, and he knew that he had two good arms on the back end on Game Seven. Why not throw his bullpen? You know, you got Glass now walking into Game Seven. You got uh, you got Morton coming in for Game Seven, so you knew that you didn't have to use all of your arms in Game Six, or you could use all your arms in Game Six and not have to use them all in Game Seven. You got you got five good arms on the backside you get to get nine, ten, eleven outs. Yeah. So uh, no, I get it. I mean, my, my thing was is with Mookie's numbers versus lefties were surprising i think for Change anybody it. you especially being a teammate yeah. and you know how dynamic he is but then to have seager behind him in a lefty i thought why not give him one more batter you you very well could have and i mean and that's the whole thing with with mookie it's it's a lot of change-ups at the same time anderson got the ground ball that he was looking for the one out guy on first it just kind of bounced the wrong way in my opinion and that's kind of where 
everybody's going to have a better sight. Hindsight's 2020. Sure. Absolutely. And, and 100%. It's easy to say it after it happened. I mean, always. And everybody's like, oh, they got a chance. Well, I mean, what Nick Anderson's throwing 97 up and away and it's strike one, strike two instead of ball one, ball two, missing by a ball. Now Mookie's in a little bit different situation. And th- I mean, it's still a one-run game, so it's not like it was not like it blew it out and the game not was over. All. The Rays didn't score any runs, and, and, and the Dodgers pitched really well. So the Dodgers pitched really you, well, that and day. that's a dangerous lineup. There's a lot of factors. I just, I just, I'm the kind of guy that like if my best is going game six, I'd rather lose with him in there, maybe a hit or two too long. But that's me personally, and I'm yeah. going, I'm going, and it. I don't. You guys, it's a different game. It's, it's yeah. a little it's bit It's totally different. different. I, we don't get that privilege to see how the games are managed all the time. But I'm going off a hitter being in that situation. I didn't play in the big leagues, but I played, you know, some pretty, like, in big games in college and stuff. Going off of being 0 for 2 with two punches against a starter, like, he's got my number. Or and then have you, bring or have you guy. seen every pitch he's got? Yeah. I well, mean, that I've was another thing. I, another reason I, I didn't like it. I'm either still was this, I'm still rather see another guy. Right, he, because he the wasn't last he three wasn't guys a, that Snell threw. He wasn't hitting his spots like he was the first 16 guys that he yeah. threw to. Right. I mean, Taylor got the single on a heater heater away that was supposed to be middle in. I think somebody rolled over a ground ball on a slider in that was left middle. It was left middle. Yeah. Now, what if you throw Mookie a middle middle slider? He might get the first one of the year, right? And and I think with Anderson being it knowing. You can throw heaters away, heaters in, breaking balls down in the dirt. You're going to get a good chance of getting a punch out there. Yeah, that's. I mean, you can look at it both ways, and and yeah. obviously there's there's no right or wrong answer. It just didn't turn his way, in my opinion. But they still won whatever it was, 51 games yeah, this year. No, it was, and there's there's a reason why they did it, and they got some good arms in the bullpen. So how how do you feel about? Because I know Tim Kirkchen made some pretty. Good. I, I mean, I liked it. I li- when he made a point about there was more relief innings than there were starters innings in the postseason. Yeah. Like, is that just the way the game's one hundred going to be from now on? Because now you're not telling guys to go out there for seven, eight, nine innings. Go out there, give us ninety pills, what you got, and when. I mean, how many guys really face out any lineup three times through and have success? It's there hasn't there wasn't a whole lot this whole season. Um, I don't know if that was because of a shortened spring training or guys not built up. But I think a lot of it is just when they see you for the third time, you've usually used all your pitches. They've seen everything. They know where your arm slot is. You get a different arm slot. It's the same reason why uh, May comes in after Kershaw with the Dodgers. You got a lefty throwing 92, cutters in, good breaking ball, obviously. And then you got a righty throwing 100 sinkers. It makes May look a whole lot harder to hit because of different arm angles, different movements, a little bit more velo. And that's why May threw the ball really well when he did in the playoffs. As opposed to when he was starting, he wasn't really the same guy. Yeah, he wasn't as effective. Right? He's- and the Dodgers did the same thing. Everybody can – nobody said anything about, you know, Kershaw got taken out with 84 pitches and May came in and shut the door. Yeah. But they won, so nobody said anything. 100%. You know, and, and I just thought about that right now when you were, th- when when, you were talking about When May about comes that. in – and I, I knew May was going to come in after Kershaw because that's the next complete opposite. It's the same way they bring in Aaron Loop, side sling a lefty, throw on 92-94 – and then they bring Fairbanks in over the top, throwing 100. You, you want those different drastic arm angles. To, it makes the box a lot different for the hitter's eyes. This, know, is, this is why he's in the big – this is why well, no, it, we're, it's, we're and high I think school coaches people on a that baseball have, podcast. have had the perspective that everybody else has had because Cash yeah. got destroyed. Mm-hmm. And, and I, he wore it, by the way. He did. He wore it, and he knew what he was walking into. He, I mean, when he made the move, he knows, I'm going to have to answer this question, good, bad, or indifferent. He, he did it all year. And obviously, like I said, Cash is a good family friend. I love the guy. I think he's a great manager. you got to think he's he's working with a, a eighth of the, of the yeah, money. I, I, I don't think you can question his managerial skills for, on one unbelievable. decision. Yeah, unbelievable. That's kind of stupid. You know, and, and I mean, he put different guys in different situations. You talk about seven guys with, seven, with saves on that team is unbelievable, in my opinion. From Aaron Sleggers, who I played with, to Fairbanks, to Casilla, to Nick Anderson, to Loop getting some saves. Um, I think he's un- unreal. And I think that one game, people are going to look at him a little different. And he, he ran the bullpen and the, the pitching side of the game the same way he did the last 74 games or wherever many they played. So, I mean, and getting back to that, like, as a right-handed sinker baller, I love coming in after sale. I mean, I had some of my best games were coming in after sale. Why? Because he's throwing from 17 feet on the first base side. He's throwing 98. 
and it's sliding like crazy and he's nasty. And I come in from the right side throwing a little power sinker at 92 and it's, I had some big games against in 19 that were just, why are they taking such bad swings? Well, these arm angles are completely different. I come in after Rick Porcello, I'm getting tattooed and I'm going, well, it's the same guy. Maybe one or two more clicks on my fastball, a little bit less sink on it. And that's where those arm angles play a lot more than I didn't notice that a whole lot until probably about three or four years ago. Yeah, and Lupa, Lupa he mentioned something real key is the hitters didn't have in-game like they normally do where they go over at bats and the stuff. The replay room? Yeah, so no replay room. All you can do is look at video from previous games. But even on the pitching side, it was tough. I mean, we I come in after most of my games – and I want to see a couple pitches. Where was that pitch at? Just like Luke was saying. Um, and they get to do that in between innings or in between at bats. And and I mean, one of our biggest guys is JD Martinez. He walks. He watches more video than I've seen teams watch. Period. And uh, that was a, a big struggle for him, just not getting in game swings. He doesn't necessarily care about looking at the catcher, this, that, and the other. He even called Manfred and tried to get some side angles just so he can see his bat path and where he's a real mechanical, real video oriented hitter. And uh, I think that was one of the reasons why he, he didn't have a great year, obviously. But uh, that's a, it's a big thing. Once you keep doing that, it's like working out or any aspect of the game. Once they take that one aspect away that you've put so much into, how do you get that? How do you still get the same results without having that quality of uh, information advantage that you have when you're comfortable getting into the box? Yeah, well, that is a big advantage. It's well, huge. Yeah, you're not having – one, you're not having as much <clears throat> prep right prior to the game. You're not no. getting your routines in on top of not having that. We and you know we kind of talked about that with Luplo a little bit. It was it was rough. It was no reason that guys' numbers were down. No, exactly. And I mean, I think I think ramping up really fast was a little hard for everybody. Um, I think a lot of people. I mean, it didn't sink in with us. But I think game fourteen, we're in New York and we had a team meeting, and I remember. Kevin Pilar, you know, halfway through the meeting, walks up and goes, hey, we got 46 more games to go. We're not going home, right? Miami already got COVID. The Cardinals already got COVID. Nobody's going home, right? The, at the end of the day, the, the owners are about to start making money in any day now with paying us back our, our advancement and stuff like that. We are here for the long haul, right? If your family's not here, you either need, need to fly them out here if you need them or get over it. And – uh yeah, that really stuck with me, and I think from that day on, the Red Sox, we played pretty pretty darn good from that point. Um, I know our first 14 games were a little tough, but that was the same situation of being being split apart. We started doing things a little bit different. Um, after after wins, we were getting in the clubhouse and doing our, you know, giving, giving props to guys that, that won us the game, if it was relievers or big hits or, you know, just going through game recap that we would usually do in the clubhouse on a normal day. Um, but we would do it a little five, ten minute powwow. And, uh, I think we, we won a lot more games in the back half of that season. Yeah. And like Loop said, if you what one game equated to like three, so pretty if you much. had, you started slow, your yeah. season was done. And we started pretty slow. I think we were two and 12 at one point. And after we got rid of, once we finally finished with New York in that series, we came back home and we started playing a lot better. How was that lineup to look at? Oh, that's fun. Golly. <laughs> We'll see. I, I keep looking at some of these trades, and I'm thinking, well, Stanton, that would be a good one to leave. DJ LeMay, who's a free agent, well, there's two spots that aren't just an automatic hit, in my opinion. I mean, DJ LeMay, who's got to be the best hitter in the game, in my opinion. Pretty I insane mean, what he did. I mean, the, the yeah, bats that I faced him, it, There's I can't find a way for him not to put a barrel on it. Well, you know, if you go back to even in Colorado, like he's he's been a good hitter since he's been in the league. Everybody said, "Oh, it's Colorado." It's because it, no, no, it's that because dude can he hit. puts the barrel on the baseball. Yeah, he can it, hit. and he's not scared to go the other way. And that's where a lot of guys wanted to shift him once he came to New York, and he was thinking, "Well, he'll probably pull it a little bit more." No, he'll find the four hole every time. Once you start moving guys over, he just hits it up the middle. You know, it, it's and that was like he's what, unbelievable. What Hefner Hefner says, like you can't. That's a guy you can't shift. No, you can't shift. He doesn't. He doesn't swing at balls for the most part. Um, when he's in New York, it is so hard to get him out because anything right center carries so well. It's a homer, and you know you, you got to get him to get it, keep him on the left side of the field. But now we we don't got a full shift on. We got second baseman playing one step over. So every ball on the left side of the field, either Bogarts is making a great play and DJ's running hard. He's one of the 
big hustle guy. And there's a reason why he's got 10, 11, 12 years in the big leagues. What was, uh, how was it for you? We asked Luplo the same question. How was it without the fans for you guys? Are you personally terrible, miserable, miserable? I mean, Fenway, obviously I know Cleveland does pretty good with their crowds, but I've never been to a place like Fenway or New York or Yankee stadium. I mean, Fenway sold out. doesn't matter if we're playing at 11 o'clock on marathon Monday or we're playing a two o'clock game on a, on a Wednesday it's sold out. It's sold out, dude. Yeah. And they are just rowdy and, uh, you know, you start listening to Sweet Caroline in the eighth, and it's the whole crowd going, all 44,000 running it up. And there were some times, just like I was listening to Loop, and there were some big situations in games that you think as an offense you can put some runs up, but there's just not that – you don't have that whole fan environment. Um, I was a fan of the crowd noise, though, because I was turned off for about a minute during a game, and it was – you could hear a pin drop. It was dead silent, and it was terrible. So the, the crowd noise did help to where you're not just on, you just wheels are spinning on the mound kind of thing. Um, so I did like that part. I thought that was a good add just because otherwise it would be, it'd be like a, a summer Legion game just <laughs> with nobody there. Yeah. You know, so that was, that was better than, than having no noise at all. Yeah. That's gotta be tough. Like, with momentum shifts, hundred percent. Cause that's then, the big one. I mean, a, a pitcher, a visiting pitcher could get rocked. Well, yeah, Lou hits that double in the eighth, and they go up. Yeah. I mean, Cleveland would have been rocking. Yeah, yeah rocking. the pitcher is going to be a little different in the in, You know, the and that, now does that pitcher have the wherewithal to slow things down? Does a pitcher speed up and try to throw a little bit harder? Does, you know, O2 count against whoever? Is a, is a hitter going to speed up on a fastball, or can I just bury a slider right here and he's thinking heater the whole way because the crowd's going crazy? All those things kind of play into it. And, uh, I mean, I kind of, it's not, obviously the game is the same way, but that, that anxiety, the momentum shift, the blood flow, the heart pump, and it's a little bit different. And I think guys that were, that can't s- slow the game down, I thought they did a lot better this year. And I think if you look at some of those guys that have, have had worse years in loud stadiums or big, big cities in Boston, New York, some of these Atlanta, Cleveland, some of these big cities in L.A., they uh, guys that walked into those stadiums on the road, they had better years, and it's I think in Houston is one of them in my opinion. Houston, it was the loudest stadium I ever walked into, going in for the save. It was rocking, and uh, I think that that against them played a big part. I know a lot of the southern nonsense that we can talk about or not talk about, but I think that had a lot to do with it. Is you you feed off of that, especially at home. Yeah. I, get, I mean, the pressure, too. It's like, oh, there's no pressure. Like, as a opposing hitter or something, you know, it's just like you don't have the guy calling you a bunch of different names. And Every name in the, the book. Bull, yeah. yeah, the bullpen getting loose. And, I'm, yeah, I bet New York's and it, just New York's fun, nightmare. man. They, uh, when you're getting loose down there, those fans out there in the stands and the grandstands are – they're rowdy. They like no. So I think we <laughs> talked about this before. I don't, maybe not, or maybe it was with Drew. I think Drew brought up the story, but oh yeah, I like you exactly. go, you go out there in New York, and they're just hounded on you, <laughs> and you have a good outing, and then like the next night you're back up, and they're giving you your props. Yeah. So that that was one of the nights we had some DIB kids come out, and uh, they were going to Cooperstown, New York. We I was in New York getting ready drew is in the grandstands obviously not wearing any boston gear just wearing his dib stuff <laughs> <laughs> smartly and uh you know he's filming me getting ready and these guys are hounding me and it was right after boone was talking about you know we got savages in the box and i'm i know who i'm getting ready for i'm getting ready for judge and obviously coming from fresno judge fresno guy it's not only that the guy's six eight two seventy brick the guy's just mo- monster and I know what he, what what my game plan is, but you got to execute against him. And uh, you know these guys are all over me, won't stop. And the whole time I'm warming up, and I end up punching him out in the six. That was the only only out or the only batter I was going to face that night. And Drew makes them, turns around and says, "Hey, give my boy some props." And they they were good. They did, you know. And once you get back out there, it's usually the same fans right. on, the, on the different night. And uh, you know, the, most of the fans are good. They're great baseball people, obviously. I think the East Coast baseball fans are just unbelievable. They, they know what they're doing. It's not a social gathering out there. It's, it's there to watch baseball, and they understand really what the game is going on. Um, that's one of the best things about playing in Boston and going all over the East Coast. Kind of get into your season, right? 
I know not all of it was how you wanted it, but Boy, like even much. even the process of getting into the what was it the instead of going down you you told oh, the new, the, yeah the alternate site <laughs> yeah like how difficult that is not going and playing triple A against yeah. opposing teams and now you're playing against spring training again kind pretty of pretty much so we'll start even from the jump was. I'm, I was in Florida getting ready, throwing bullpens. I come back home to Fresno. I was home for about six weeks, and we're throwing live ABs against a lot of the minor league guys here in town. And I was throwing the ball well. I was – Velo was good. Slider was good. I get ready to go to – you know, and they uh, – what was it? Two days before we agreed, I call Mike Myers, and I go, hey, you know, what does it look like? You know, we're getting like a little – like a – some kind of like a meal money in essence. And I'm just calling to make sure I get mine. And uh, they go, well, we're, we're not signing. We're not, we're not agreeing. It doesn't look like we're playing. All right. So two days later, I'm getting ready for my last bullpen, my last live AP. And I go, well, I'm going to throw today. If we don't agree by July 4th, I'm going to shut it down. So I've mentally shut it down. And uh, we up agreeing and they go, Hey, you got to be in Boston in three days. Okay. I'm still throwing. But nobody really thought we were going to get through this whole season. I go to Florida, get all my stuff that I left there. I head up to Boston. We go eight days without throwing a baseball. And I don't know if people have thrown a whole lot or done something consistently. When you take eight days off, I know Luke was talking about even Call of Duty. You take eight days off, boy. <laughs> you know, he's getting molly whopped out there. And I came back to season or came up to Boston and threw my first bullpen, and I was all over the map. And so that's where – Things really, I was trying to figure it out. I'm, I'm on the phone with Brian. We're doing FaceTime lessons and in my hotel room trying to figure things out, like why are things not syncing up? And Because I was throwing the ball really well when I was back home. I was throwing the ball well when I was in Florida. So we get into the season, still not throwing the ball well. I'm still kind of just missing spots. Sliders aren't good. And it's really, really small adjustments. And that's the hardest part is Brian's not there to watch me, who has done a lot of my pitching coaching for – the last 15 years I've been pitching. Um, but it's just small adjustments with my wrist and this, that, and the other. So we're working on it. I get into the season, and I have a couple bad games against – one against the Yankees, and then I have a really bad game against the Rays. And it wasn't even that I was not throwing the ball with a velocity or, or sinking up. It was I'm missing spots. I'm getting homers hit off me. I gave up more homers this year than I did in the past three years combined. So that's where they they kept me up. We were working in bullpens. I threw 60 pitches in New York, pitched that night. Next day, worked through about 25 more pitches in the in pregame through that night. So I threw about 150 in two nights, just working on trying to figure it out. I get an off day. I go to Philly. They go, hey, you're down. We got a doubleheader in Philly. I'm down. Ninth inning, we bring in our pretty much our eighth inning guy, Austin Bryce, to get the save in game two. His lat tears, and he's trying to throw through it the whole time, and he's wild. So they, I get up in Philly, and now I'm throwing 150 in two days with an off day. I get up in Philly, and I get hot, and I just start throwing, and now I'm, things are starting to click because it's 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 rapid rapid fire. You're not thinking. There's nothing to think about. It's just get up there, throw your best pitch, end up getting the save in Philly, and then once we, we kind of keep going and. I, they let me try to figure it out, which is really unbelievable on our GM side, our pitching, you know, our manager side. When I did get sent down, I go down to our Pawtucket, our AAA stadium, but it's the alternate site. So we have 25 guys there. I think we have 14 pitchers, five catchers, and like eight position guys. So it's not like we have a full game going on. It's like Sandlot League right. baseball in essence. So we're facing five hitters. And we'll have a first baseman, a shortstop, and a center fielder. So there's not like holding runners on. There's not. It's not a game situation. Um, and you're just once you face those five guys, you flip the order over, and you're facing the same five guys. Uh, a guy that's going to be up in the big leagues with us soon is Duran, one of our center fielders, and he is unreal. And every time I'm pitching, he's leading off every single time. And it's like you've seen me three times in a matter of two innings. It's getting tired. I'm getting tired of facing the same guys. But those guys know what you're doing. You know these hitters pretty well, but it's not like they're giving you a scouting report on them, which is kind of like AAA baseball. But they, it's just the whole morale. that They do the crowd, it's the crowd noise, and but you're really just grinding through it, and it's, it's like 
uh, the off season of, of baseball and just trying to get your work in, but at the same time getting ready to go face the Yankees and hopefully in a call you get a call and two days later you're facing the Yankees. So that's that's the hard part. But there was just a lot of, I mean, we were going, I think we had 12 o'clock games on weekdays and they wanted us to get there at like 1030. And so when you're getting there at 1030, you're rushing to do all your stuff. Hey, we only have three innings pitched today. So we're there from like 1030 to one. And now there's nothing else to do. And I'm not a Call of Duty guy. I'm not. So, I mean, it, it was it was, it was was tough. Being away from the field was just as tough as being out the field, in my opinion. Uh, we were kind of locked down and, and stayed in our hotel rooms a lot, ordered a lot of DoorDash. And it was a tough, especially being down was a lot tougher than being up, that's for sure. Not only just the competition-wise, but just actually playing baseball was the big part of when you go down to AAA, which I did in the last two years, is you're going down, you're still playing ball. I mean, you're still facing the same guys. It's a little bit different. You don't have 40,000 people. You got five or 6,000 people at the games. Um, this year was a lot different. And when I got down there, there was a lot of guys that were down on not only themselves, but like the whole process of what's really going on. Like, why am I here? You know, I talked to Bobby Dahlback and making sure he's mentally okay because you're going to get called up. The trade deadline's coming. We're going to trade away Mitch. You're going to get called up. You better get ready. You got to make sure your swing's ready. You got to make sure your body's ready to go play 20 in a row. And uh, he was. I don't know if you guys. Yeah. (laughs) He walked in and first hit of the year. Seven seven homers in 21 days, 21 games, something like that. Um, But he is awesome dude, awesome hitter. And and guys like that were were down once I got there. And and just trying to talk to him, make sure guys are ready to get ready to go to the big leagues. Um, but we did end up calling quite a few guys up from from the alternate site this year, um, not only position guys but a couple pitchers as well. That's just tough. It's, well, yeah, because you, you, like in even in AAA, or normally you still have that travel element. Oh boy, Hard you're, you're not seeing the same four well, or five a, hitters over. But now and over. your routine's even worse. Worse, worse. way got, worse. You got an hour and a half to get ready. Yeah, like, and I mean, I'm, I'm. They wanted to do a bunch of stuff, hip mobility, things like that that I'm working on. Once I got sent down, and I mean, it was, I was with the trainer for an hour of it. And you know, there's there's other things you got to get in, and and so getting there getting there later in the day, but having a shorter time was really tough. But I mean, I still still got to be there, still got to lock it in, and and know that you, it's more selfish once you get down there, especially in that situation, because you're doing it for you and you only, as opposed to in AAA, you're still. You're pitching the, these innings because you're trying to help the team, or this, that, and the other. You still got a team morale, um, still playing games, still trying to win. There was no winning in this alternate side. It was facing the same four or five guys, and uh, that was that was one of the harder parts of it, I would say. Yeah, hopefully that it doesn't happen coming now. We'll see. Next I, season. I'm hoping there's double A AA and triple A baseball this year. We'll, you think maybe they'll just add add a couple? I think yeah. I. I my personal opinion, I don't know how the, how spring training is going to go. I know uh, some of us have same sites, but there's no way that we're going to allow 60 guys in our big league clubhouse, which fits 58 people. Um, I think we're going to use a minor league side. I think, in my opinion, I think minor league baseball is going to start, or double-A, triple-A big leagues will all start at the same time, hopefully. And then I can see them bringing in A-ball guys, younger guys, after we leave our spring training facilities and then bring them in for a spring training and then kind of have like a hundred, 120 game season. That's kind of way I would, I'm hoping it goes if it's not all the way full fledged, all baseball, but I don't, I don't see the, uh, Visalia Oaks and the Grizzlies starting on the same, same day. Yeah. I mean, how, I mean, 60 game season, that's just difficult. Like, what do you think about, like, we talk about the MVP and all that. I mean, I know they everybody played 60 games, so it's kind of hard. But when you talk about – I had an issue with Tingler, the, the Padres coach. Mm-hmm. They said he has the best winning percentage in team history for the first season or whatever. And I'm just thinking, like, but he only managed a third of a season. Like, I feel like some of those records are, are things it's, it's hard to – Yeah, we'll see what he does next year. Yeah, you know, it's just, like, hard for me or, like, Bieber winning the Triple Crown or, like – he threw the ball well. Though. I know he did. It's just hard to. But look at all the pitchers in the central this year. Yeah. All this, all the pitchers in the central threw the ball really well. Mm-hmm. But look at, I mean, not knocking the offenses in the central, but 
the power of the offenses are on the west and on the east. I mean, and when the Astros are on the east or on the west, and the Rangers are on the west, and and even all the the whole East Coast, the NL teams this year were unreal as well. But uh, a lot of the it was a pitching heavy central division all the way up and down. Um, but I mean, look at the two Cy Youngs are going to come out of there. I think. I mean, I know Degrom is probably going to be. I don't even know who won the Cy Young. To tell you the truth, I think it's, it's even be, been noted. It yeah. hasn't been. I don't think they've come out with the Cy Young yet, but I think it looks like Bieber for sure in the AL, and then Bauer and Degrom battling. They're going to battle it out. And Degrom's nasty. That was fun to watch. That was that was a good one to go watch. I watched him versus Evaldi, and there was nothing but a hundred mile an hour pills coming downhill, and uh, that was a fun game to watch. How many guys? Because people don't get to see it, obviously. But in such a sort of uh, short season, how much did you? How much stuff did you guys go through physically? Like, how many guys were like fighting through every day, oh, all season long? Almost everybody, you know, because of that that short and ramped up. You know, guys weren't able to to. Th- so, like in spring training, you'll see it. The starters will play three innings for like two or three days, get a day off, play four or five innings, get three at-bats. If they get three at-bats in the first three innings, they're gone. Done. They're doing something else. Um, and then they play seven innings, play nine innings. We were trying to get our position players ready to play nine innings, but not one person played nine innings before the season started. So that's where playing nine innings is not easy on the body, especially as a position guy. I don't know how they even do it personally. They – and – you get guys, older guys, Mitch Moreland, you know, even Bogarts has got foot issues. He was battling all season. Um, guys like that are, are grinding their way. Luplo had a back injury. If you have a low back injury, it's hard to stand for five hours straight, let alone be active and go swing and try to barrel up 98 on the corner. So those, those are the things that guys were battling all season long, and I think you saw a lot of injuries in those 60 games. Um but going back to the record of like winning percentage and all that, dude, <laughs> what if it was a 20 game season? Blackman would have been the best hitter known to man. Yeah. Right. He was batting 720 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. in the first 20 games. And you're going, well, I mean, is he going to hit 400? Yeah. And then 20 games later, he's batting 330 and batting his normal, which is still good. Which is still good, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. But you know what? Like he, at one point, he was batting 504, yeah. 508, whatever yeah. it was. And I mean, DJ LeMay, he was too. And he's still batting 350 or whatever he did this year. Um, but, yeah, I think the whole 60-game season, obviously every everybody did it, but I don't want to put that this guy's the best hitter on planet Earth because he did something for 60 games. Now, winning percentage, that's all cool. He's going to – Tingler's going to be the manager again next year, and we'll see. Um, I wasn't a fan of and his And they're comments. good. They're good. Yeah, they're good. Don't get me wrong. It's just they put that up there, and I'm like, he's only managed 60 games. Like, how do you – in in franchise history, like yeah, what were you gonna say? What comments? The uh, the ones? comments of him the three one, yeah, the three zero, yeah. Don't back your player, one hundred percent. But not only that, if we go back the year before two thousand nineteen, Mike Myers is going for two hundred punch outs, which is oh, a yeah. good number. In Texas yeah. in Texas against yeah. the Red Sox, it's a good number. Don't get me wrong; I'm not going to knock it. But two hundred punch outs is not, you're not going to not play baseball to make this move. And we had Andrew Benatendi hitting. Yeah, Andrew Benatendi hitting in the eighth. He had 199 punch outs in the sixth. We go up in the seventh, hit three ground balls or three fly balls, whatever it was. Doesn't get a punch out. And he's at 130 pitches going into the eighth inning. Benatendi hits a fly ball with two outs. A pop-up. A pop-up to yeah. first base. And Guzman, who I played with in Dominican, they're yelling at him to drop the ball. And – now you're not playing baseball. And so if we're going to be mad about a 3-0 swing, I don't like it personally. If you go 3-0 and you pop it up, I'm fist pumping that. I just got an out. And and that's what a lot of I think a lot of pitchers would say. If you don't want to get a 3-0 swing, don't get to 3-0. Right? The same way if Snell doesn't want to get taken out, don't get a guy on. You finish the game if you went up there 1-2-3 every inning. Um, but I didn't like how – he, he didn't play baseball in 19, so Mike Myers can get his 200 punch outs, but then he's going to say that's not baseball with a 3-0 swing. I'm all – if you want to swing 3-0, I mean, what are you going to – wait? 3-1, he throws a cookie, you're going to hit a homer, you're going to be mad at that too. Well, it's like you get to you get to 2 now you automatically have to throw me a ball. Yeah. It's like the same thing. Right, if I know? throw a backdoor sinker and I get you looking, 
no, you you can't throw that pitch. It's got to be a swing and miss. No, I'm I'm still going after trying you. to get you yeah. out even more right? so. Too. But what? How did that guy get to three zero? Did you have you watched that at bat? Because it was bases loaded. They were up by eleven runs or whatever. First pitch slider down. Second pitch heater away off the plate. Third pitch. I'm pretty sure it was a slider. So now he knows he's throwing a heater. Yeah. If you're going to throw me a 2-0 slider up by 11, I'm going to ambush the heater away, and he did. And, I mean, Tatis is just that strong and that good of a hitter. I watched him. I got to face him in the Dominican before he was in the big leagues, and I was telling Brian, this guy's for real. I watched him play him and uh, Vladdy Jr. before they came up in 17 or 18, whatever year that was. But I knew, I mean, Tatis was 16 or 17 years old at the time, and he was the real deal. So I, I like watching. I big fan of watching him play. Yeah, and I think he plays the game hard and yes. right to me. You know, like he wants to steal bags. He's never and, given up in that bat, and no. right there proves that he is not going to give up in that bat at all. And that's and at the end of the day, if you can take that and you tell a, a manager that hey, this guy's going to get five hundred and fifty at bats, he's never going to give one away. You're going to take him every time. Same with relievers. And you know, when we we're pitching and we're down by nine or up by nine. It's real hard to get three outs, and it's even harder when the spread's a nine-run spread. Um, and I think that's why I don't want to say – like closers have a hard job to get those last three outs, but sometimes you're facing the seven, eight, nine hitters with a three-run lead. That's a lot easier saved than facing <clears throat> the two, three, four hitters right. with a one-run lead. Or even if you're facing the two, three, four hitters for the Yankees with a nine-run loss – you know, those are you still got to go out there and get three outs, right? And his job is to barrel up a baseball, and I, I'm I'm all in on him swinging at that. That's personally. where you got you know you hear college coaches talk about that a lot, but makeup, right? They talk about the makeup of guys. That's yeah, and and, and it's not giving any at bat away, not giving any pitch away as a pitcher, things like that. And if you can get nine of those guys that aren't going to give up at bats, you're going to win a lot of ball mm-hmm. games because they're going to be locked in. They're going to do something for the team. Was he trying to swing out of his shoes and hit a homer? No, he hit it to right center. Right field, actually. It went right over the right fielder's head. So it's not like he was ambushed and helmet flew off and he tried to pull the heater away, right? I mean, he stayed on the ball, stayed through it. He just got a lot of juice. What does him being tied to Texas, Tingler, have maybe that, maybe respect for that organization? Maybe that's why he didn't. What is it? Was it Woodward? Who's the coach, the coach, Texas coach? I don't even know. I think so. I don't know. He made a big fuss and it's like. Now, one, I'm with you guys. I'm just being – Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm playing the other side of the fence there like I always do. I don't know. I'm still at the point where it's it's not like you're stealing a base. Some of those stuff, yes. the unwritten no. rules or whatever people want to talk about are different. But base is loaded, 3-0. Like. But, and, and he led – I want to say at that point he got up by six or, or three RBIs leading the league. At the same time, he's out there making trying to make some money. He's, make, he's on league minimum. He gets to arbitration. Those three RBIs, four RBIs are going to pay him eventually. You know, so that's where at the same time, they're still playing these 60 games and those, just like you said, every every game's worth three. You get those three, four RBIs. That's a huge, huge thing in a uh, when you get to ARB and you want to want to go make some money. Well, not only baseball. It's base. I mean, it's baseball. It's, <laughs> it's not. No lead is safe. No, never, never. And that's. And it's the big leagues. We're not we're not talking about little league, you know, baseball or even high school baseball where you're up ten and you're probably not going to come back. Yeah, you know, you know, but it, now stealing bases, doing some things like that, yeah, that's a different ball game. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're taking your at bat and you're taking it serious, if it was three zero in the second inning, I'd expect him to swing also. I know that's one of our in our meetings. It's who is a three zero swinger, and you'll go through the list. There's about seven of them. So you're never thinking these guys are going to take 3-0, 0 doesn't matter. That we, we That is one of our stats that we keep, and we go over every single meeting is who's a 3-0 swinger, and obviously Tatis is. That's what Garza said in his episode. He's like, if I knew he was a 3-0 swinger, I would throw him a 3-0 slider. And 100. if I walk him, I walk him. I'm, I'm, I'm giving, giving, up, I'll, I'll I'm go giving to up one run and, yeah. and rather than four. <laughs> exactly. And and you should know Tatis is a 3-0 swinger. That's not yeah. his first time doing it. Um, but they got a lot of them on that team. Will Myers would have done the same thing. Mm-hmm. Will mm-hmm. Myers, I face him. He is a 3-0 swinger. So they got quite a few on that team. But that's why if they get one good pitch to hit, their job is to barrel it up, and he got it. Yeah. I love it, man. I love it. I do. I love I love hearing all this stuff. It's great. Yeah. 
Speaking of managers, let's just get an let's hour go. into this and not talk about <laughs> it. Uh, it looks like the Red Sox today. Um, this is Friday, by the way. It'll be out Monday. Uh, it looks like the Red Sox are, well, you'll have to clarify it. But Cora will be managing the Red Sox going forward. From my understanding, yes. I uh, I woke up this morning from a text from not a uh, one of our kids at DIB. His dad texted me, said, hey, Cora's a manager. I had no clue. It was like 6.35 in the morning. So I get online and I start looking it up. And, yeah, um, I'm very, very excited to have him as a manager. I thought he was one of our best ma- – my best manager I've ever played for personally. Um now we'll see how that all entails. I know we kept a lot of his staff. I know we still have some people that we still got to hire. Um, we kept our first base coach, which is Tom Goodwin, Fresno guy. Uh, we kept our third base coach and our hitting coach. I believe our two pitching coaches are staying as well. So I think he still has a couple guys to fill the, the voids with. But uh, I loved playing for him. I was actually uh, – he obviously he gave me my, my chance in 2018 when I made the team – but he's always, to me, told told me what he is feeling, and that's I mean, at the end of the day, that's he called me in the office in nineteen, and just had a real real good conversation about what do we need to do to get you back to where you were, what do, like he's very open in the clubhouse. He knows how to how to manage a lot of good good players. He knows how to get guys to play to their full potential. Um, I think he's one of the big reasons why Bogey and Devers played the way they did in two thousand nineteen and eighteen. Um, I think there's a big reason that he he keeps that light mentality in the clubhouse, <clears throat> but is still able to get guys to play to their full potential. And he is a he is a manager that you want, in my opinion, you want on your staff that is going to have your back day in day out. Um, and he he understands a lot of guys, and especially in that clubhouse. I think a lot of I know a lot of players were pulling for him to to come back. Um, so we'll kind of see. I'm I'm super excited. I know I texted one of Ryan Brazier, one of my good friends, and he was fired up about it as well. I texted him as well. I know he's his phone's probably a little busy right now, but uh, I'm excited to hear from him, and I'm sure I will this week. So clarify a little bit. Um, a lot of people thought he got fired. False. Um, so if you want to clear clear, or the maybe air, didn't or, know because, like you said, Agent Hinch was fired. fired. So yeah, the the GM for the Astros and Hinch were fired. AC and Carlos Beltran both stepped away before a lot of this stuff hit the fan. Now, were the, if this came out and then after, were they going to get fired? Most likely, if they were going to get suspended for a year. Um, but, you know, Core never got fired. They had a mutual agreement that he would step away. That was before the sentence came out from the Astros stuff from 2017. It wasn't about the Red Sox or anything that was going on there. Um so they stepped away. They knew, they kind of knew what was going on, but before any of the suspensions were were finalized, Cora had stepped away for a year or stepped away from being a manager. That way, the Red Sox had time to to find their manager. We ended up going with Ron Renneke, or who was our bench coach. He was <clears throat> awesome bench coach, awesome manager to play for this year as well. Good golfer. Got to play quite a bit with him in eighteen or nineteen. Um, so things like that. But yeah, Cora wasn't fired. He was – they came to a mutual agreement to step away, and I think that was the right way to do it. Nobody really knew exactly what the penalties were going to be. If he didn't get suspended, he still would have been away for a year. He's got a family at home. He's got two twin girls that he would love to see. It. Um, so being able to talk to him, and even in spring training, it was just making sure his family was good and he was with his family a little bit more this year, which I think he was. And uh, I'm excited to have him back and being in the clubhouse. And I think the old the team morale and the you know having the having that manager that's a little bit younger and gets guys pumped up and and able to walk on the field. And I mean, even last year he's able to go out there and take ground balls at short with bogey, and he can he can still pick it. The guy can still play, and he's he's letting guys know what they're doing. He's a very good communicator. Um, obviously, speaks two languages, and that's I think that's a big part of being a manager and being able to communicate with both sides, both players that are from Latin America and America. I think that's a, a huge relate. part of it and relate. Yeah, and, yeah exactly. Relate. I mean, he played infield. He, he did every role as an, as a player as well. He came off the bench. He was, you know, he was a pinch runner. He, he played a lot of infield. He played on some really good teams. Obviously he played in these big cities in Boston. 
I think he handles the media really well. Um, I know we were getting some heat there for a little while in 19, and I thought he he handled it really well, even after winning the World Series in 18, and everybody was kind of all over him. But he managed those big contract guys just as well as he handled the guys that are just getting called up. Um, but I mean, we had a lot of guys on some big contracts, and he kind of I don't want you don't say they put him in check, but everybody did their part walking into the game, walking in the stadium, knowing who's there, and and he he reads people really well. Um, big fan. Obviously, I'm I'm super excited to have him as our manager this coming year. I saw some stuff too, where you know, there's and like it's everywhere, it's, right? Everybody's got their opinion, which is but th- but they are even talking about you know Hinch with Detroit getting hired, and I don't know, you know the guys from the Astros got the play. Yeah, every single one of them. You know, and I, I, I think after, the, I think after Loon, sto- the I think, bigger story is La Russa. I love it, by the way. I love it. <laughs> it's true. I love it. I think that's true. Which was the same week, right? They both got within the, or the within same a day. Couple days, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, La Russa got hired a couple of days ago, and so we're we're flying back from London, and there was only seven or eight guys awake on the plane. Everybody else is sleeping. It's five in the morning. Who knows what time it is? And we're playing cards, and La Russa's up front, and he's talking to us, and I'm playing with Sale, and. LaRusso like starts to talk and sale like puts his cards down and looks at him. And Tony's like, well, you can keep playing. He's like, no, you've been winning world series since I've been in diapers, probably before I was even a thought. When you talk, I listen. And that's coming from Chris sale. And I'm like, God, you're right. This guy's been doing it a long time and he's won a lot of world series. His baseball knowledge is unbelievable. So being on that plane and listening to him to and talk and, and just talk about the game and, and situations and things like that, dude, I'm kind of, I'm excited to see, how that's going to play with the White Sox. And, yeah. and obviously they're a younger group of mm-hmm. guys that, that play the game at this young age of bat flips. And, and you know, they got some big below in their bullpen. They got some good arms. Obviously they got some huge bats over there. So I'm kind of curious to see how that's going to play. And like, who is he going to hire as his bench coach? Because I think that's going to be a big tell on, on how they're going to go through it. You know, we had AC and Renicky. You would never see, I would never think those two would be great friends. And they were. Uh, Renicky's 75, 76 years old. AC's a lot younger. Um, so I'm kind of curious to see if Larusa gets a young guy. I mean, it could be even like Sam Fold, who was running for the Red Sox job, um, that wants to be a manager and kind of learn from, in my opinion, one of the best yeah. baseball knowledge guys. So I think whoever is going to be his bench coach will be a manager here very soon. Not necessarily for the White Sox, but I think they want to get a pure baseball headed guy in that clubhouse to run that team as opposed to just – and somebody that, that demands respect from being there for so long. I mean, this guy was – I mean, he was managing when a lot of – Tim Anderson was probably not even born yet. Yeah, probably not. You yeah. know, so things like that. I think winning that's – World Series. I think it's – yeah, winning World Series, doing it. And I think that's a big play, in my opinion, is you walk in and, and you're not – you get a guy that's going to demand respect the way La Russa does. And when he walked in the clubhouse, he was, he was awesome. And everybody almost stood at attention when he would walk through because – you knew if he had something, it's it's meaningful. It's something that you're going to be able to take to the bank, and I think that's going to be a, a big thing in, in Chicago. I mean, you got to remember too. He coached, he managed the Bash brothers. Yes. So Canseco's ego, Maguire, that whole one hundred percent. He Ricky Henderson, it. yes, was just as flashy as Tim Anderson. Yes. So Same. I mean, I think I think it will fit. Okay. I, I think he's and they're gonna he's gonna like I said demand respect in that aspect, but at the same time he never took anything away from those guys. He never tried to hone them in into being something they weren't. And I think that's what's gonna be kind of cool to watch the White He'll Sox coming be themselves one hundred percent. But then be able to be a team guy and 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 how do we gain more wins? Because you face that lineup and it's I don't want any part of it. They got some guys that are hard hard barrels to get out and. uh I think it'll be. I think they're going to have a pretty good year next year, in my opinion. It's I think funny they need you to get another uh, starter. No, go ahead. Yeah, I mean everybody needs another arm. Yeah, I mean, Every, anyway. anybody needs one, right? I mean, so, but I mean, I think they got they got some good guys and they got some they got some guys with stuff on their in their rotation. Um, their bullpen's not bad as well, so I think uh, they'll match up. And again, but they're playing in the central and and. They're one of the few offenses, in my opinion, that are just unbelievable in that central division. So, uh, Luplo will have fun with them. <laughs> it's funny you say that about the, you know, how hard it is to get some of these guys out. And when Luplo's saying the same thing, like, 
Do you know how hard it is to get an extra base hit oh, off yeah. of these relievers? Not only that, I mean, the, the defense on the back side of us is, I mean, we had three center fielders at one point with Mookie, Jackie, and Benny playing the outfield. You could put anybody and they'd be, on most teams, it would be the starting center fielder for a lot of teams. Um, so getting those extra base hits are few and far between, let alone you got different slots coming in from different angles. And there's not a whole lot of 88 coming into the home plate anymore. <laughs> it's pretty nuts. I don't, I don't, go ahead. No, you go. You go. I was just going to ask him what it looks like for you coming in. So kind of the same situation as last year. Um, walking in, I still have one option left. They can still send me down, which I'd rather keep my option than not have it. Um, but definitely going out there and fighting for a road, fighting up for a spot in the in the bullpen. I really like throwing, and me and Renicky talked about it going into this year. Uh, I like throwing the sixth and seventh inning. I like being that bridge guy. I like coming in after starters, um, but I like coming in with guys on base. I, I feel like I do a pretty good job of getting some ground balls and getting some double play opportunities. Um, if they need to get length, I can go out there and throw 40, 50, 60 pills if I need it. Um, be able to get a day or two off after. But uh, I really like the role that I played in 18 or 19, sorry. And a lot of that was communication from AC. If we had guys that were down, I did have a couple saves that year, knowing that I would be on the back end of the bullpen throwing the seventh or the eighth, depending on how our bullpen was matched up. Um, I know we're going to go get some arms. I know odds are really good. We're going to go get one or two relievers. Um, so it, it'll be same same thing. You got to walk into camp and, and try to fight for a spot, and you got to earn it. Could have been an all star. Could have. Probably should have been. We talked, should have been. We talked about this. Yeah. I mean, you did have not some saves. I mean, going to the All Star break. No, we had wins. You had a lot of wins. Not five in the wins. Like I think it was like six or seven right before the All Star break. I I was nine and one walking into the walking (laughs) into the break. Nine and one. Nine and one, and I. That's a full season for some starters. Yeah, the boat on that one. And they uh, had a couple bad games. One was in against Cleveland. Uh, Rain delay. Walk out there. Gave up four and two innings, and then I had two other bad rougher games that. Same situation, uh, but that's where the mental side of the game and, and not getting ahead of yourself and and there was people texting me, oh, you're, you're going to do this, that, and the other. No, I know what I need to do. I need to th- throw strike one against whoever I'm <laughs> facing and go go from there. Um, but that's where, yeah, I, I definitely got some messages and some text messages and and things like that when that was going on, and it's hard to think about. And I, that's where. Knowing as a as a as a closer, you you know you're getting those last three outs, and that's where those guys are are very mentally strong and and prepping their body and their mind for those last three is <clears throat> the same way as getting walking into the All Star break, going, hey, I need, I got three more outings, I got three more outings, and then you're kind of thinking, don't screw it up, as opposed to, hey, if we just keep pitching the way we have been, we're going to be all right. Yeah, I want you to explain the option part because a lot of people out there base wise they don't understand the option and what that means okay so we have once you get called up to the big leagues you have three years three option years which means they can send you up and down as many times as they want for that one season let's say you you get a lot of these guys that are september call-ups um they'll get called up in september and never get sent down so that doesn't count as an option year the following year they can get sent down, up and down. And a lot of it is relief pitchers or, or pitchers for that matter. They'll go, you know, two weeks up, s- spend 10 or 12 days down. So when you get sent down, you have to be down for 10 days straight unless there's an injury. If there's an injury, they can call you back up within those 10 days. If you spend 20 days in the minor leagues through the whole season, that considers a full option year. So in 2019, I was down for 13 days. I didn't make the team out of camp. I was down for nine days or t- nine or 10 days. And there was an injury. I got called up, went to Arizona, <clears throat> was up for a while for six weeks or so. Um, Through two and two thirds, got sent down later that night, getting ready to go to New York and got sent down for three days. And then we had another injury. That was when Dustin Pedroia got hurt in New York and I got called back up, and I spent the rest of the season up. So I had 13 days in the minor leagues, so I never used an option. And then this past season, in 2020, I got sent down for a total of 14 days straight. So again, I never used my full option. So I still have one more option year left, which means they can send me down one more year. Once that option is used, that would be my third one, um, 
I used one in 2014, 2018, and then I have one more. Once that option's used, if they are going to send you down, they have to DFA you, which is now designated for assignment, which means they're taking you off their roster, their big league roster, and now any of the other 29 teams can pick you up, but you have to be in the big leagues. You can't just be on the 40-man roster. You have to be on the 25 or 26-man, whatever we're going to play this year, 26 or 28-man roster, and you have to be in the big leagues with whatever team that is. They, the way they roll through that is it's the last place team gets first pick, and then they all either sign you or, or pass on you, um, and all the way up to the first place team who gets the last option to pick you up. That's how guys are able to, like, whoever the Rangers or whoever's in last place can pick up guys that are getting DFA'd um, first before the Dodgers get to pick you up, whatever it is. Um, that's how they're able to kind of even out and give you those, give teams that chance to pick up somebody that wasn't good enough or didn't was struggling with whoever the Red Sox. Now the Giants can pick him up if they think they're, he fits in that in that bullpen rotation or or in the rotation or wherever position he plays. Um, but there's a lot of guys that I mean that's when guys they do a lot of traveling. I've I've played with a couple guys that that are out of options and get DFA'd for three or four different teams and they're on three or four different, you know, three or four different cities. And it's pretty easy if you're by yourself and you just pack up your two luggage bags and your <laughs> baseball stuff and get on the plane. But when you got a family and you got kids and a house and all sorts of stuff going on, it, it becomes a little bit more difficult. Um, that's one of the reasons I'd like to keep my option. I love playing in Boston. Um, I like playing for the Red Sox. The city is amazing. My family, they, they like being in there. They, uh, they like the the atmosphere. They're very good with our with our with our kids and with our wives. They uh, they accommodate them pretty well, I would say. And uh, so, I mean, if 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 you get sent down, you go down to AAA, the, you you grind it out, and you ho- you hope you're not down there for 20 days straight or 20 days through the season. Get called back up. Um, but yeah, it's I'd rather keep my option than be out of options because then I know I'm. If you get DFA'd or you don't make the team, there could be a whole lot of flights, and I don't think my wife and my three kids are ready for that yet. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's crazy, man. Yeah, there's. I've had quite a few players. Uh, one of them is Nick Ramirez, and I keep seeing him. I mean, he he was with the Indians a couple couple years ago. I played with him with the Red Sox in AAA on his last option year. Um, but God, man, he's he'll he's got great stuff, and that's why he keeps sticking around. He's 33 or 34 years old, and but he'll get DFA'd and go to a different team, and he'll be there for three weeks, four weeks, and get DFA'd again and, and move across the country. And I don't know how he does it. I'm I'm wore out with that stuff. There's a lot to process. Dude. There's just so many. There's, the business side of this game is it's it's tough, and and it's it's something that you don't really fully understand until you start going through it, and if you aren't going through it there's no point in understanding it in my opinion because there's so many rules and and time manipulation and and super twos and when does a guy hit free agency things like that and it's there's a lot of stuff and it is a business for these guys it's not i mean these owners are spending a lot a lot of money doing this just like any other business that people have you're not going to pay you know your worker 35 dollars an hour next year because he worked an extra six hours this week you know you're just not going to do it same way with guys with bobby dahlbeck he ended up getting called up on the 28th of august if he got called up on the 21st he would have been a super two walking into the 2023 season making five and a half million instead of five hundred ninety five thousand or whatever league minimum will be that year you know so they the business side of it is very very big i mean one of my buddies just got option last year he got sent down. We were having the same numbers, the same struggles at the same point of the year. We were both looking at each other like, one of us is getting sent down, dude. We got a prospect coming up. He's 22. He throws 100. Um, so he ends up getting sent down. They sent him down for 27 days. They use his option. He misses being ARB eligible by four days. So I keep my option. Now I stayed up. I ended up having a really good back half of the year, but that whole business side saved them, me having another option, and saved them another nine hundred to a million dollars, nine hundred thousand to a million. That's what he told me right when our ARB numbers came out. He goes, "Hey, I missed ARB by four days," 
it's only 900,000. It's all right. You're fine. <laughs> no big deal. And it, you know, I mean, this guy, <laughs> so that's, that's the kind of thing. And he's, he's older. He's, he's been over to Japan. He's, I mean, he his first year in the big leagues was 2013. And now we're talking, walking into the 2020 season, going to make our money. And he missed it by four days because he got sent down at the wrong time for a little bit too long. And the owners know it. I mean, they know what they're doing. Yeah. It's the same reason Chris Bryant didn't make the team whatever year that was, 2012 or and Harper too. Yeah, people were going crazy. Yeah, you know what I mean? And, and But it's a business, and, and that's what these things are. Obviously, they want teams to be good, and they want these teams to win. But it's the same reason why the A's don't sign anybody for over $10 million or whoever. It is. I know they got KD, but uh, they uh, – you know the Rays are the same way. They it's it's a full fledged business, and and that's the side of the game that a lot of people don't fully understand, which is fine. I under I I understand why you don't understand it, but when it is your livelihood and things like that, you you start to pay attention a little bit more, and and things start getting a little screwy, and uh, and that's where guys are going to arbitration and trying to win cases and and trying to go and make a little bit more money. Sounds complicated. It's it's a little too complicated. Yeah. <laughs> now before we go, we want to talk about DIB, the yeah. academy, the baseball Let's academy. Do um, I don't think there's any other baseball academies in our area. I'm not sure. Academy wise, there's travel teams all over, but I'm talking about academies with places to go get better. Right, because DIB does have their travel. They have their organization, travel organization, yeah, but, but you guys. If you want to get some work, yeah, you take any, anybody. Yeah. So and if everybody. you play for CBA, if you play for any of these travel ball teams, if you need a place to work to out, to train and, better. and practice, that's one of the things we do. We just opened up, I think, about a month ago. We uh, we do have classes that we do hitting op- open hitting classes. We do defensive classes. Um, I'm running a pitching academy right now on Wednesday nights. Um, but I mean, that's we're doing two and a half hours on Wednesday nights, and then you're able to come in on Sundays and throw bullpens as well. Um, but we do, and you also have rap soto. Yeah, we do all of that. We actually have 10 different rap soto certifications. We have, I think we have six guys. I don't have a hitting rap soto certification. I, I'm not going to teach hitting. I'm not a hitter. Um, but we do have guys that, <clears throat> that do like Brian, he hit in college, all American hitter at, at Fresno city also played professional baseball as a pitcher. Um, he has both certifications. I believe, um, one of our other coaches has both certifications, but yeah, we do have all the all the analytical side of it. Um, we also have a hit tracks in there, which is like Rap Soto, except now it becomes more of a virtual reality game. They'll play defense for you, um, things like that. That there is so much technology in the game right now that that is where the game is kind of going. But that's where the Rap Soto will kind of give you the the analytics of it. I necessarily. I mean, I've, I've been using Rap Soto for quite a few years. We Once I got with the Red Sox in 17, we started using it. Um, and I learned from guys that are coaching it in the big league level. And they're, it's a little bit different talking to, and if you guys have ever seen the certification, it's hard to, there are a lot of the, the nerds are teaching the Rap Soto. And I want to say nerds just because they didn't play a whole lot of baseball. You could tell by I'm the way they're computer talking. computer literate. Yes, and I'm not computer literate. Mm-hmm. I know how to read a Rap Soto. I know what what balls are you know if we're working at certain angles how to make them better but that's more of a, a pitching side of myself that i've been in the game 10 years before rap soda was coming out in the last four or five years that the analytics have really taken over um but that's something that we we've had a rap soto and the analytics side of the game for the last three or four years which really helped my game um that's one of the reasons why we got it was really personally for myself working on sliders working on sinkers and making sure I can repeat my delivery. But, yeah, we do have the the pitching academy going on. Uh, Colby does catching academy, and that is where – that's one of our – probably our, I want to say, hot commodities is pitching and catching. But Colby does really good. Colby and Brian both do really good with the catching academy. They uh, they do it – I don't even know the days. I know it's on our app or on the uh, our Instagram. But a lot of it is just guys that want to get extra work in. A lot of them are hour-long classes – they, you can sign up on our Mind and Body app, but all of our schedules are on our Instagram. But a lot of it is just guys that we want anybody that is just looking to do extra work. It's not about playing for our teams. That's not what we're doing. A lot of it is just guys that, I mean, we had, I think we had 17 catchers at our last catching academy. There's not a lot of guys that can coach catching. 
And you, I mean, if you've never caught, it's really hard to teach. It's, it's something either, I know like your dad caught and it's something you have to be able to get back there and understand what's really going on to, uh, to teach it. Um, but yeah, a lot of those things are, are classes that are open all week. A lot of them are from like three o'clock to six o'clock, depending on the age group and things like that. But a lot of our guys, I mean, all of our guys in our facility that really run it have played at a high level of baseball. And, and I, I personally think that we have some really good coaches and, and now we're starting to, to get it out there a little bit more. And now that the state's start, starting to open up, we, uh, our classes are starting to get some people in them. Well, and you're, you're there. Like you're not yeah. just the guy that's, you know, Hey, I'm in the big leagues and <laughs> no, guess- especially in my throwing in, in the pitching program, I'm running it. Obviously I've, I have four other guys helping me with it. We had 20 kids in it on Wednesday. Um, but we're going through different situations and or different stations working on stuff we're we're throwing i mean we're going through a a throwing program we're going through a stretch routine how to warm up med ball workouts uh throwing off the mound and then on sundays we're able to get into more individualized bullpen sessions with me and justin miller who played a couple years in pro ball still trying still playing um it's either me and justin or me and brian will be in there so i'm really I like the Sundays a lot more than I do Wednesdays just because I'm able to actually get hands on with pitchers for if it's a 15 or 20 minute bullpen session and really work on different pitches and pitch techniques and being able to work on grips and and try to change some things up and how guys are are really using their body as opposed to like Wednesdays we're really going through how to condition condition our arms how to how to get guys onto the mound and be able to take breaks and get ready for in-game innings and things like that, and understanding we're in the classroom for 30 minutes with each group, trying to understand, you know, what what pitches are sequencing with each, with each other, how to set guys up, how to recognize hitters, things like that. The uh, the pitching side of it is a lot different than the hitting side. There's a lot more mental game to it, and and obviously it comes down to execution. So that's why I like the Sundays, being able to execute and, and try to get guys get going on it. Yeah, so that's the DIB Baseball Academy. Um, go look for those up. that don't know. It's on a shirt, but Let's I mean, do, do it big. Yep, do, do it, it big, big. Baseball Academy. Um, yeah, go check them out on Instagram. Um, you guys don't really do the Twitter that much. No, um, more on Instagram. That's pretty. It's much. It's pretty much all the Instagram. Um, and we'll, yeah, we'll go check them out. out. They have the classes where you can see what's available. Um, and yeah, like a, like you said, and we've been saying, it's go get better. You know, That's, guys, yeah. go go somewhere where you can get better, and uh, you're not worried about you know being you know to a travel team or something no, like that. No, this no. is all to get work and get ready for your upcoming season. One hundred percent. That's what, what guys are able to come in and and be able to come in and you could if you want to rent out a cage and hit with your dad. That's fine. We can do it. We can set it up. Um, but if you want to get to where we're going through certain drills or certain stations. We obviously have those academy classes. There will be, I know Zach Colby does a lot of the stuff and Brian Oliver do a lot of our hitting stuff. Zach Colby does a lot of our infield, him and Jordan Gar, and Brian and Zach do our catching. We might have a couple other guys kind of helping out, but really our guys that are, that are running the program, like I've drew up our whole pitching program. Me and Justin sat down for about four hours and kind of set up how we're going to get through stations, what drills we're going to do on certain days, things like that. So there is a plan to our process. Um, so it's a it's a good place to come in and get work that's away from your team facility or team practices that if they're not practicing enough or you want to hit on a Tuesday, come check us out. We'll be, uh, we'll be there. Love it. Um, well, definitely hope that – like you said, we don't know what's going to happen in 2021. No clue. I'm hoping. I'm uh, hoping we get to 162. That's what we're hoping for. And fans, and yes. it was nice to see that in the World Series. I did see – I talked to a couple people that went to the World Series games, and they they enjoyed having limited fans because it wasn't long lines. It wasn't packed. It wasn't didn't take forever to get in and out of the stadium. But I'm thinking, man, there should be 40,000 there, Yeah, not 11.5. Yeah. But I mean, eleven five. I'm. I'd like to talk to some of the players and see what they thought on how to get a how they felt with a limited acts like limited fan at the game. I'm sure it was better than not having fans. I think that was a big thing in the uh, 
in the NLCS having fans there instead of only at the World Series, like when the Rays played in yeah. San Diego. I think that was a uh, kind of helped them out, and you can kind of see momentum well, they, shift they a little bit more. They played in one stadium the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. So they kind of had an advantage of the, the atmosphere. And I would have liked to see, instead of being in San Diego personally, being in Miami – because the state was open, they could have had fans in that city, and that stadium is amazing. That stadium in Miami is unreal. So I, uh, I would have liked to see that because I, you know, you could have had fans in in Miami and in Texas. We all knew there wasn't going to be any fans in San Diego, being in the state of California. But uh, that was one of the things I wish we could have done a little different with the MLB and how the playoffs kind of set up. But I think having the fans is is a big thing. I think the owners are pushing for it. I know John Henry wants his fans in, in Fenway. I bet. I bet. You know, uh, but I think they, they like the atmosphere a lot better. You know, And it was even weird like not having people in, on Lansdowne Avenue. The only time people got to see us practicing or anything was in the uh, – there's like a cafe restaurant in Centerfield that people were able to go. But, I mean, I know a lot of people that went out there and, and watched us warm up and be able to – that's the only little bit of baseball you got to see live. Well, in Boston, didn't you guys have a fan jump the, oh, the boy. Green Munster? Oh, boy, yeah. That was right on the back end of the season. I don't know how – I mean, I I could see how he scaled the wall on the backside of, the, of Fenway. If you get up to about 10 or 12 feet tall, you got some kind of box or somebody gives you a boost or whatever, you can you can scale the I-beams on the backside. <laughs> But yeah, he was in the uh, camera. It's not well. recommended. Out no, there. Yeah. <laughs> I would not advise doing that. And, and but that's what I. It's a what? In, it's an eighth inning. We're playing the Yankees. Ryan Brazier's pitching. We got two outs. O two count on DJ Lemayhew, and this guy starts screaming in the camera well in center field. And on the on the baseball side of it, all Brazier's thinking is, I haven't. I every inning I've thrown this year for the last. 18 innings, I've gotten a punch out. And he had a ground ball, pop fly, first two outs. And he's facing DJ LeMay, who, who we know is hard to punch out. 0-2 count, and he's thinking, all right, I got I got slider in the dirt, heater up and away. This guy starts screaming in the center field, in the camera well in center field, and it's a 15-minute pause. And we're in the bullpen, and I'm no farther than 20, 20 yards away from this guy. And this guy's screaming all about all sorts of nonsense. I mean, one of the things he was telling the the police officer that walked up there about four minutes later, you know, either I'm walking out of here or I'm jumping. Well, <laughs> if you jump on those seats that's covered by a black mat, you're going to be in trouble. You're not making it. You're not walking anywhere for a solid six months. Both legs are going to be in a cast. So, you know, I kind of wanted to see it. <laughs> but... I mean, so he ended up about 15 minutes later. They ended up getting him. They he ended up going to a mental institution, and that was the last thing we heard from him. But I was 2020, I was, man. 2020. Yeah. I mean, that couldn't have wrapped it up. That was. But the important thing is, Brazier punched him out. There we go. Pitch. There we go. <laughs> and I was pumped. <laughs> he ended up going O2 slider and got him. And like that was. You know, I talking to him. Obviously, we're walking back to the hotel after, and he's like, "Dude, this was all that was going through my head. I got 15 minutes to think about what pitch I'm throwing." You know, and he ends up getting DJ with the uh, with a punch out on the slider. The last game we won against the Yankees, the only game we won, I think, this year against the Yankees. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know if that guy gave us some luck on that on that last win or what, but it was that was something that I don't know how anybody would even think about getting on the backside of that 40 foot monster and scaling the wall and just the, the impressive part was the cameramen never moved they just stood their ground <laughs> they never flinched and uh so i w- if i was in the camera well i'm either getting out of there or he's not gonna or be in the camera <laughs> yeah he's not gonna be in the camera well too long you're gonna probably lose your job or something yeah so whatever i mean defense. but it was good uh, we wiped down the uh the hand the uh, handrails to make sure nobody got covid and so they were they were a little worried about it but yeah we wiped it down and Kept the game going and ended up winning the game. Off to Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope we see some uh, some fans. That'd be nice. I think we will. And, and, we and will. a full season. Some normalcy. Yeah, we'll see. Hopefully things continue to – things improve anyways. We'll yeah, have to man. just wait, wait and see what they do. And I'm sure they're doing it now. I mean, it's they're not going to wait till the end of the year. What I was really surprised is watching on Instagram, being able to see winter balls going on down in the Dominican and – 
I think Puerto Rico is playing. I know Mexico and Dominican are playing. Um, so that's always good to keep the guys keep guys going. You got to think anybody that was not at the alternate site, if you weren't in the the sixty player pool, you didn't play one game. You didn't play one inning. So uh, there was a lot of a lot of guys were were not playing. Another guy was in Australia that I saw. So they are playing some baseball, from my understanding, and get guys ready to walk into the next season, get some reps, and I'll well, just wow. have to wait and see. Yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Um, get the podcast on Spreaker, Spotify, iTunes. Cameras over there. YouTube. Hit you can it. subscribe here on YouTube and Sacramento. Right, right here, the <laughs> Sacramento. You're the best. Love yeah, it. thank you. They just, there are some of our best listeners. Yeah, really? believe it or not, yeah. it just keeps getting Sac-town. bigger in Sacramento for some reason. Sacramento. I, I just my keeps brother's it. up that way. So we appreciate that, and everybody. Shout everybody. out, Rob. Rob, yeah. Yeah. Rob yeah. <laughs> if he uh, listens to it. Um, and then the store. Yeah, we're gonna have a store come out again uh, for the winter. For the winter, so we're gonna have. We're actually gonna have the like he's wearing kind of the 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 Three nice. Um, I don't know if it's Nike though. It's not Nike. <laughs> it's uh, it's still good quality. Yeah, it's, absolutely. You know, we can't we can't afford to sell our stuff for forty bucks. Um, <laughs> We're going to have like more of a training style hoodies, like the thin hoodies, uh, long sleeve and sleeveless because all those guys want to show off their biceps. Don't um, do it. Don't do it. Come on, dude. We've we got to put it, out, put it out on our store. Let's get some long sleeves, get some short sleeve <laughs> hoodies. I'm all in on the short sleeve hoodie. Um, and then we're going to have our regular hoodies. Some hats. And then uh, we're going to throw a flex fit hat out now. Uh, we had some people asking for, asking for a flex fit. So we got a flex fit and then our normal uh, – camo snapbacks and then uh, trucker a uh, camo trucker hat, yeah so. so and it'll probably be the last one of the year i would I yeah think. for sure so uh, if you haven't got anything yet uh, oh and gators yeah and masks. masks and all that stuff but uh anyways mr walden you're the man dude hey, thanks for uh, having we me appreciate guys. you you got you and loop have been real good to us man and we appreciate that a lot uh been very uh open with your time and and supportive yeah absolutely you can easily we say gotta, no yeah we got to get get both of us on at the same time like we did before yeah, spring that was, and yeah. maybe once you guys are starting to get ramped up and heck yeah dude. january february before spring training do it live we're, we're in going. we're in heck yeah maybe if lublo is not driving home from the gym <laughs> that'd be a good <laughs> start <to> car accident <laughs> car accident yeah, yeah. that'd be a good start let make sure he's at one place <laughs> now we appreciate you doing this man and that's uh episode 84 marcus walden boston red sox it's a hit or die podcast hit or die <laughs>